Hey guys, this is Chris from the Maker's Field Guide. What I'm doing here is posting a shortened 15 minute video of another video, it's over an hour that I posted, which I highly recommend if you want to see the full step-by-step -step details of this bronze samurai master build. So first of all, I start with this resin kit. This is a garage kit as they call them, because these guys literally build these things in their garage sometimes. Uh, this one isn't doesn't look like a cast, model. This one looks more like an injection molded model. Uh, I'm not going to get into the differences here. There's there's big differences between the two, but this kit is injection molded and it appears to be extremely highly detailed. It's about three inches tall and uh, that's the reason I got it just because it's perfect for an office or a desk and just have this little warrior sitting on your office. So what I'm doing here is breaking off the flashing and cutting it off with an exacto blade. And you want to be careful here because sometimes these parts snap off and they go flying. That one went flying off camera. Here's another example taking these samurai swords and cutting the flashing off there as well. You want to be careful not to take too much off. But if you have a sharp blade, that helps. What, so you can see what happens here is the kit parts, they fit all together. I believe that this kit had probably somewhere in the ballpark of 25 different parts. They have these little notches and those are called keys and when you register the parts together it's called registration. So you just register those parts together, they fit perfectly together. Here's a hot glue gun, this one's a Pro Kleber brand and the reason I'm using hot glue here is because it actually fuses the resin model kit parts together. It also dries in a matter of seconds versus an epoxy that might take somewhere between 5 minutes. If you have 25 parts, you're going to be holding each one of those parts together for five minutes. So that just doesn't work. This brand, it's a Clo Pro Cleaver. I got it from Amazon, somewhere around $25. This is my favorite glue gun by far. I've tried a f quite a few of them out. It comes with this cool case and it also comes with glue sticks when you buy it. These are multi-purpose glue sticks. It's a 100 watt gun. I don't see any need getting something he more heavy duty than a 100 watt. This is, it works for basically anything that you're going to need it. It's a highly robust gun and it melts the glue magically. So I would recommend this brand. Get it off Amazon or wherever you can find it. I usually put something like a post-it note stack here underneath it just to keep the glue from spilling over and getting on a desk. You can see when you melt the glue down, you want to make sure that you just dab it. You don't go overboard with it. Another thing too, if you can see what happened here was I waited a little bit too long for the glue to dry. So if you wait too long, sometimes the glue dries prematurely. So when you press the parts together, they don't really stick correctly. So you wanna make sure that right after you dab the glue on, you wanna press the parts together. Sometimes you have to hold them just for a few seconds and then it should cure instantly. I mean, the glue just, it just dries instantly. That's why it's great for a kit like this that has a lot of parts. So just dab it on here. Be careful not to touch the hot glue when it's curing and do not touch the nozzle of the glue gun because it can lead to burns. I know from experience, so just be extremely careful there. This part, you can see all the details of the face. It's just an amazing kit. I got this one from ddhobby.com. So I put the links on my blog post and as well as all the other materials I'm using in this build. So if you check out the blog at themakersfieldguide.com, you can check it out all there. I just glue these together one by one and here's the final kit. What I noticed was there's a little piece on the edge that I wasn't too happy with so I'm going to sand it down. I have a little sandpaper wallet that I created for myself that I keep in my tool kit. I just cut a bubble mailer in half and then I put all the grits from coarse grit to fine grit from 100 grit all the way up to 1500 grit and this little wallet and it keeps everything clean and organized. This is a little sanding pad that I use. I love the sanding pads. That's by far my favorite choice of sanding. I take these pads and I quarter them up. I just cut them into squares with an exacto blade. And then I just keep them here. I keep extra ones here at the top of my tool kit as well. You can use whatever you need as a backer, anything that's foam. I take children's play mats sometimes, little sanding blocks that you can buy from an automotive parts store, erasers. Anything can work. I usually keep my, I hold on to my sandpaper because if you just throw it away after one use, it's kind of, it, it's a waste. So I usually hang on to the sandpaper. You can wrap it around these little sanding blocks or these foam pads and it gives it an even surface versus if you just use your fingers alone because the fingers are going to, it's going to create a bunch of un, uneven waviness because it's just our fingers, our fingers aren't completely flat. So you want to have some sort of backer 
that's where these foam blocks come in. So I just go in, I sand this off with a, a coarse grit and then sand it off with a little bit of finer grit. I take this model outside. Here's an automobile primer from Rosoleum. That's my favorite brand. I highly recommend it. It has a higher solids in it than most primers. And this metallic spray paint from Rosoleum, this is an oil rub bronze and it has a metallic effect. It's not a complete black and uh, it's just perfect for a bronze effect on this model. I just love the effect that this creates. So I, I highly recommend getting that brand if you can find it. I usually get, I get these from Ace Hardware or Lowe's or Office Depot, whichever kind of hardware store is nearby your area, you'll probably be able to find Rust-Oleum brand. It's a pretty, pretty big brand. They distribute all over the world. So you should be able to find that specific brand. Uh, what I did was I took some coupon books and I just masked off the area just to make sure that it covers from overspray you want to make sure that uh, your area is pretty clean. Always work in a well-ventilated area. I usually wear NIOSH respirator mask with cartridges when I'm working with paint, just so you don't have to breathe in the chemicals. Here I'm outdoors, so I'm taking my chances and not mask just because it's so well-ventilated. Uh, you want to make sure that the area that you're spraying is also covered too. You don't want leaves or just dust or pollen falling on your, on your model or your part once you're actually spray painting it. So I'm actually spraying this on a balcony that has an overhang that's protecting it. So here I'm going in, I'm spraying it with multiple layers. Uh, you want to spray it in multiple light layers versus one heavy layer, because if you go on too heavy, chances are the paint's going to drip or it's going to pull up and it's just going to cure unevenly. And it's if, if you might have drip marks on the model itself. So it's just going to ruin the quality of the details and the surface that you have on the model. So what I'll do is I'll apply one light mist coat first and followed by two medium coats afterwards. Each coat typically I'll allow to dry about a minute or two in between, maybe up to three minutes. And uh, just, just apply evenly overlapping strokes. So that's highly recommended overlapping your strokes. Keep the gun nozzle e equal distance or evenly distance apart from the model at all times. So I usually choose about six to eight inches. I'll also spray a little bit from the gun first before I actually spray on the model just to make sure that it's not dabbing or clogging. Sometimes when you keep these these uh, spray rattle cans locked up or you have them in storage for a while, the uh, nozzles tend to get clogged and it tends to spatter up. So sometimes I'll just spray for a, a couple of seconds to make sure that the clog is all clear and good to spray. So that was the, the second coat. And I turned the gun upside down to clear it afterwards where it was dry to handle is what they call it or to touch. So usually after a couple hours, it depends on the paint formula. You read that all in the back of the can. Here I flipped it upside down to paint the underside. And I didn't want to lay it on its side because sometimes it can cure and it just rips up the paper. So I, I flipped it upside down with two toilet paper rolls and let it cure that way. And it came out really good. So then I took the model back inside. Uh, here's the little Iron Man statue that I created. I'm going to create a demo on that coming up shortly. Uh, here is a reference that I took from Disneyland. So these are actual photos that I shot on my iPhone. And I was actually at the park with my girlfriend a about a year or two ago. And I saw these really cool statues in the middle of the courtyard. The main one is Walt Disney here. It's called a partner's statue. And this is with Mickey Mouse. And as you, as you can see, it has a, a patina effect. When that when that statue was actually released in the park, it looked like a like a copper penny. It was just so bright. But then, as it gets oxidized, once air starts hitting it, it starts creating this patina layering effect. And that's just a chemical oxidation process that happens with metal. But then, uh, what happens on the smaller models like Donald Duck? When people start to touch it, it starts to rub off that some of that patina, and then it exposes some of that brass kind of copper effect the more of the bronze underneath and it just creates this cool like highlight effect and it creates like this marbling transition in between the dark patina and the actual bare bronze statue so i just collected all this reference i thought it was really cool i love seeing these statues like this it just has a really nice luxurious effect really super high quality and elegant even for little cartoon characters like that so that's the exact same reference and process that I use on this Iron Man statue and what we're going to do here for this Samurai Master build. So once we have the paint coat cured underneath of the Rust-Oleum, the oil rub bronze, what I'm going to do is take these this tester's paint 
It's an acrylic enamel. These are the paint that you that you paint little car kits with. And it's a gold flake. The color here is called a flat brass. The technique that I like to do use best for this is to take paper towels. And I'll just take a paper towel and dab it on the actual paper towel with the paint. And then I'll dab that paint that's on the paper towel on the model itself. It just kind of creates this kind of dry weathered effect. It's it's not too perfect. Like if you take a paintbrush, sometimes I, I get in the tendency of of getting too too perfect and too tight with it. And then it just it just doesn't look right. It looks too mechanical. It doesn't look like it's been weathered. So I recommend taking a paper towel and just just blotching it on there. So just touching it lightly on the areas that that face up towards the sky. That's the methodology I'm using here, taken from the reference of the Disneyland statues. So it's just basically giving the effect of where a model would be touched or rubbed over time. It, say if this was a samurai warrior outside of a dojo in Japan or Asia, and it's just sitting out there over the ages and the statue gets this patina and then people start touching it over time and it kind of creates the same exact effect that we saw at Disneyland. So I'll go in there little by little. It's easy to overdo it here, so be careful because sometimes you can put way too much on and it just it doesn't look right. It doesn't look like weathering. It just looks like it has too much of the, the brass copper color on it. So you want to balance the, the copper from the darker bronze underneath the base layer just so it kind of gives it like this really cool weathered effect. So just be careful with that. Sometimes you can knock it back down by, by using more of the paint that we used before. Sometimes I'll have a hard time reaching some of the tough spots, so I'll take a Q-tip as well. And there I show you, you can just use it as a paint can and spray it. And this is getting close to finish. And here's the final model in all of its glory with the bronze weathered application to make it look like it's been sitting out like a samurai warrior that's been encapsulated throughout the ages. And you can see that the gold flake or the flat brass was applied very sparingly to some of the highlight details just to kind of bring those out. It really brings up some of the details. This model is insanely detailed at a three inch scale. And uh, I just love taking a look and, and geeking out a lot of these little details up close in person. So this was the final demo. As I mentioned, the detailed list of materials and where you can find them from is all available on themakersfieldguide.com. It has the overview of the materials and the tools and the tricks and some of the still shots that you can see for this build so that you can either build one on your own or you can use this same process of the flat brass and the oil rub bronze to create this effect on anything that you could ever think of from a 3D print to a product, whatever your imagination might have you make. On the website, you'll also find a copy of my book, The Maker's Field Guide and The Maker's Field Guide Master Maker Edition. If you're a serious maker and you're serious about stepping up your game to the next level, I highly suggest you getting that book. And it's going to teach you everything you need to know on the art and science of making anything imaginable. That's it for now, guys. I look forward to seeing you all on the next one.